Storage is the most critical element of media production and storage technology is changing daily. Tonight on The Buzz, Chris Hafner specializes in storage for OWC and he shares his insight on the future of storage technology. Next, Walter Biscardi is legendary in our industry and the founder of Biscardi Creative Media. Tonight he explains why Atlanta is such a mecca for media. Next, it's time to bust a few myths. Scott Sorensen has been the director of photography for Mythbusters for the last nine years. Tonight, we go behind the scenes to discover the production gear he used to create such memorable programs. All this plus Tech Talk, a Buzz flashback, and Randy Altman's perspective on the news. The Buzz starts now. Tonight's digital production Buzz is brought to you by Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. And by Blackmagic Design at blackmagicdesign.com. Since the dawn of digital filmmaking, authoritative. One show serves a worldwide network of media professionals. Current, uniting industry experts, production, filmmakers, post production, and content creators around the planet. Distribution. From the media capital of the world in Los Angeles, California, the digital production buzz goes live now. And welcome to the digital production buzz, the world's longest running podcast for creative content producers covering media production, post production, and marketing around the world. Mike Horton has the night off. Yesterday, as you'll learn from Randy Altman in a few minutes, HP announced several high-performance mobile laptops. A striking part of their announcement for me was that Thunderbolt 3 will be built into this next generation of workstations shipping in December. Thunderbolt 3 is significant for two reasons. First, its speed, and second, its connector. The initial release of Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt 1, supported a data transfer rate of 1.1 gigabytes per second, while Thunderbolt 2 supported up to 2.2 gigabytes per second, though in practical terms, the speed was limited to about 1.3 gigabytes a second. Because Thunderbolt supports both data and displays in the same protocol, there were challenges with Thunderbolt 2 for displays since most editors don't really need the fastest speeds that Thunderbolt 2 can provide. However, Thunderbolt 2 was not fast enough to support external 4K or 5K monitors. Now, we have Thunderbolt 3, which supports up to 4.4 gigabytes per second, which is fast enough for two 4K displays. This is four times faster than USB 3.1. But the real news is the connector. Thunderbolt 3 removes the need for a mini display port adapter. Instead, it uses a USB-C connector, which provides both power and data. Now, this soon-to-be ubiquitous connector offers the possibility of Thunderbolt to move out of the rarefied air exclusive to high-performance workstations into the much broader market that USB offers, plus USB-C connectors are a fraction of the price of Thunderbolt. Apple now provides USB-C connectors on their latest MacBook Air, but hasn't announced any immediate plans for supporting Thunderbolt 3. Also, I want to remind you to subscribe to our free weekly show newsletter at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Every issue every week gives you an inside look at the buzz and the industry, and every issue is free. I'll be right back after Randy Altman with Chris Hafner. This is Randy Altman's Perspective. Randy Altman has been writing and reporting in our industry for more than 20 years. She is the editor-in-chief of her own website at postperspective.com, and we were able to track her down on the streets of New York. Hello, Randy. Welcome back. Hi, Larry. Good to be back. We missed you last week. I hope you had a good time. And in fact, it's about that good time that I want to ask. What's been, what have you been up to recently? Well, this week I spent in New York. There's been a few different things going on. Um, I spent my first two days at an HP launch event where they introduced a whole new line of mobile workstations. So uh, ZBook line, and they're faster, stronger, thinner, lighter, uh, like four and a half pounds 
typically, and um, they are built for our industry. They're built to run editing software and, and let people work wherever they want to work. Randy, PCs in the past have been pretty weak on style. Has HP picked up the style points? Absolutely. The systems look much more slick than they had. Um, again, they're thinner and lighter, so yeah. that makes it uh, easier to work with. Dell also, a couple weeks ago, introduced a new mobile workstation that's I believe it's under four pounds, and it's very thin, very light, powerful as well. So they're they're not giving any of any of our post professionals an excuse uh, <laughs> to leave work at the office. You could work anywhere, anytime, and still get the power that you need to to run the software. You know, Randy, thinking about the new workstations that HP and Dell announced struck me in contrast to what Tim Cook was saying, which is that the new iPad Pro is all the PC most people will ever need. Are you seeing a dichotomy there? Absolutely. I do see that that is the way that they want to go, and they want people to be working on tablets and, and through the cloud. But right now, people um, are embracing these mobile workstations that are very, very powerful. And I do know that Dell and HP are very happy that and Tim Cook did mention that because they're looking forward to getting some more of that market. So if it, if it does happen, it's not going to happen overnight. I understand that's their, that's their goal, but it's a, it's a big wait and see right now. Turning our attention to software or anything else in the industry, what's caught your attention this week? Well, last week Autodesk announced a Flame software version and also some new subscription models from the company. And I think this is a long time coming. I think it's what users have been asking for, and they finally get their wish. So now to have a flame, you don't have to be tied to a turnkey system uh, through Autodesk. You could just buy the software, and it's some um, subscription model. So you could, if you, if you buy a subscription for a year, you could, I think it's 500 a month for a flame, and it's a little bit more if you do it month, month to month. But I've been noticing on some forums that, People are excited. They can finally work on the flame. And um, I think it's going to open the software up to a lot of people, and I think it's the right time because I think people were, were looking for alternative ways to do that kind of work, and now the subscription model allows them to, to get their hands on software that they couldn't have afforded in the past. Anything else before we leave you this week? What, what else has caught your eye? Well, I actually just got to the CCW show, which has now been rebranded NAB New York. So I'm eager to, to go down and take a look at what's, you know, what's being shown. But that's, that's news as well, is that now NAB is, uh, has a show in New York. And we also look forward to the NAB show coming up in Las Vegas in a few months. Randy, thanks for joining us today. Randy's website is postperspective.com, and we look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks, Larry. To read more from Randy Altman, visit postperspective.com. Still to come on The Buzz. When you're working with media, one thing is essential. Your computer needs peak performance. However, when it comes to upgrading your Mac, there are so many different options to choose from that the process can be confusing. That's why Otherworld Computing carries the best upgrades that lets your computer performance and storage grow as your needs grow. Since 1988, OWC has become one of the most trusted names in quality hardware and comprehensive support to the worldwide computer industry. With an extensive online catalog of Mac, iPhone, and iPad enhancement products, as well as a dedicated team of knowledgeable experts providing first-rate tech support, OWC has everything you need to take your current system to the next level. Whether you need to maximize your system's memory, add blazing speed, or enhance reliability, look no further than the friendly experts at OWC. Learn more by visiting MacSales.com today. That's MacSales.com. Chris Hafner is a mass storage specialist in product development and integration at OWC. He's been with the company for 12 years and was the driving force behind their brand new Jupiter storage product line. Hello, Chris. Welcome. Hello. It's good to have you with us today. Thanks for taking time out of your day to join us. Uh, thank you. 
Chris, what first got you interested in storage technology? Well, I, I like to fancy myself a little bit of a geek, so I've always been interested in, in anything that had to do with computers and technology. So uh, personally, that's how I got involved in this whole arena. <laughs> Well, nothing like being a geek to get your interest. And, and I was thinking your title is Specialist in Product Development and Integration, which sounds really impressive, but what does that mean in English? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a unique title. It, uh, it means that I, you know, when I develop these products, I'm, I'm always looking to make sure that they are integrating with, you know, customer workflows, integrating with other pieces of the product puzzle, so to speak. So that, you know, we're not designing a product just to tackle one specific you know, task. We're, we're designing a product that will be adaptable for what you need it to be as much as possible. Um, and if it's a big, if it's just a piece of the, the bigger puzzle, that's great too. You know, so we're trying to, to, to build products that, that really integrate on many different levels with the workflow and, you know, our, our entire product line. Well, with the possible exception of camera technology, I can't think of anything that's changing faster than storage technology, and it's going in multiple directions at the same time. What technology in storage is currently driving the market? Is it still spinning media, or are we trying to find a way to make SSDs affordable, or what, what, what's driving us right now? I do think South State definitely has a, a big impact right now. Um, I, I'm not going to count spinning, you know, hard drives out, out of the mix, though. I think they are still part of the, the bigger puzzle, you know, driving the storage. And, you know, the, the video market and the storage market really kind of walk hand in hand. Um, they both kind of feed off of each other. And, you know, we still have a lot of capacity with, you know, hard drive, uh, standard spinning platter hard drive media um, at a lower cost than we do with, with some solid state right now, some solid state technology. So, they, they really are still very both important. So tell us about this new product line that I was reading about on your website. It's called Jupiter, which you were involved with. What's this? Yeah, so um, we have Jupiter Callisto and Jupiter Core. Uh, Callisto is a unified storage appliance, and it's a fancy word meaning that it can do both um, NAS and SAN if you want it to. So it's, it's a, a flexible system. Uh, most people go the NAS route. It, it tends to be a little bit easier. Uh, so we're talking uh, SMD protocol, AFP protocol, NFS networking protocols. Um, Jupiter Core is uh, a, a JBOD mini SAS expander system, um, really high performance. You can use that as a standalone storage system. So you attach it to a RAID card or a Thunderbolt RAID adapter, uh, mini SAS rate adapter attached to your computer, and you can have extremely fast and very large storage. Uh, well, but Callisto is, is really the, 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 it's the bigger piece. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's expandable, um, a lot of cool features that baked in there. Well, I was reading on the website that these devices can be either network attached storage, an NAS, or storage area network, a SAN. What's the difference between the two? It's a good question. It, it basically boils down to file level versus block level. Um, when you're doing, when you have the Callisto set up to do a SAN, you're basically saying, okay, take this storage that I created and, and project it out as um, an iSCSI target in this case. So it's basically saying, here I am, I'm a, a block level device, just like a, a, a hard drive would be when you put it into your machine. Um, but uh, whereas NAS, sorry, will be more of a, a file-level approach so that you're saying, okay, here's these, these files that you can have access to. Is there a difference in performance, or do end users see a difference as they're using an, a NAS versus a SAN? Performance is pretty darn good with both of them. Uh, Callisto has onboard 10 gigabit Ethernet ports, uh, 10 G-based ports, so they have backwards compatibility with gigabit Ethernet. Um, both methods will completely saturate that plus more. Um, you know, there are certain applications where you do want block level, uh, wh where it's just going to be a little bit more efficient. Um, I'm thinking a lot of times databases can kind of be lumped into that little category. Um, but for, for a lot of scenarios, uh, the, the NAS method is, is 
perfectly fine and, and more than acceptable, more, more than needed. Well, I was just thinking in terms of Final Cut 10. Final Cut 10 only supports network storage when it's formatted as an XSAN as opposed to other uh, storage area network environments. Uh, do you emulate or can we run XSAN on these devices? Yeah, um, you can. Uh, XSAN will actually see the, you need iSCSI initiator software, um, which we, we do sell. Um, you need the, the iSCSI initiator software on a Mac to, to be able to initialize, uh, initiate to the, the, the projected out iSCSI targets. Um, trying to keep this simple, but uh, yeah, you, you, with the software, it'll then present the, uh, the, the ones to the, the Mac operating system. Um, that can then be used within Xan. I was just thinking, we've got a variety of other raids from OWC. Thunder Bay is probably the most well-known of the group. What makes these different from the Thunder Bay raids that OWC already sells? That's a very good question. Um, with Callisto, we're talking very massive storage. Um, so when we, we're, we're looking at developing uh, the, the Callisto uh, product, we, we wanted to use technology and use a file system that uh, w was fundamentally uh, meant to be expanded and expanded and expanded. Um, and now ZFS is what we actually use for the, the, the back end of this. Um, we do have plans to, to gradually roll in different features of software, which is what we actually pair with the Thunder Bay system. So again, Talking about the integration, we're really trying to make sure that we can hit different pieces of the puzzle and tie them all together. Um, but yeah, with the ZFS, it gives us uh, a, a enterprise next generation file system, so to speak, uh, that allows us to uh, expand beyond belief. Um, I think it originally ZFS originally stood for like zettabyte. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can. It's almost infinitely expandable. Uh, not that I'd recommend that. There's always a a, a practical limit in there. But uh, yeah, it was, with ZFS as a storage backend in Callisto, um, it was really designed to to keep you um, just easily expanding as you need to and as you grow. With uh, both devices, one of them has a mini SaaS attachment, which means we've got to have. Uh, fiber channel go into all of the different uh, rooms in our editing suite. The other is 10 gig Ethernet. For people that are Ethernet wired as opposed to fiber wired, what cabling do we need to be able to run the Ethernet device into an edit suite? So we we have 10 G based T ports built into Galisto um, as, as the two default connections on there. Uh, we can add in optical based uh, 10 gig of Ethernet. Uh, ports as well, but with the 10G base C, you use standard CAT 6A, CAT 7 cables. Um, so a lot of times, uh, places already have that built into the wall. They already put in CAT 6A cables. So uh, that was one of the reasons we chose that th those ports is because we wanted to have that backwards compatibility with gigabit Ethernet, um, but allow you to, to to get a 10 gig switch in the mix and, and take advantage of the 10 gigabit Ethernet speed. Um, without having to upgrade your entire infrastructure. What happens if we've only got CAT5 or CAT5e? Does that mean the systems don't work, or they just don't work as fast? Um, they can work. Uh, definitely not recommended. Just, uh, there, there's not enough shielding with those, those rated cables. Um, you can actually do CAT6 cables, which is pretty – CAT6 cables are pretty common out there. Um, officially, I believe it's supported up to 50, 55 meters. Um, I should know that off the top of my head, but uh, with CAT 6A and CAT 7, you're, you can go uh, almost double that. So uh, it's, it does boil down to interference and crosstalk and, and a lot of that stuff. Uh, uh, no question. I'm just thinking there's a lot of shops out there that are not yet wired for fiber and not yet wired for CAT 6 or 7. I'm just trying to get a sense of whether they should even consider this hardware or not. Yeah, um, you know, because of the 10G base T, uh, you, they can use it perfectly fine um, as, as gigabit. And with a switch, you can set it to, to be only communicating a gigabit. Um, so really, it, it is about, you know, you get this very robust system in there, um, and you upgrade as you need to uh, to take advantage of the speeds or as your budget allows you to, to gradually upgrade your infrastructure. 
So again, we we did design it with with those ports on there so that um, you can use it now, uh, even if you can't upgrade your infrastructure to get the higher performance cables in there. Uh, you can use a system, same system you can use five years from now, uh, as, as with the the existing infrastructure you already have. What are we looking at for pricing for these two units? Um, starting just uh, under five thousand uh, for an eight bay system. Uh, there'll be an eight bay Callisto system, and for the core systems, which are the the, the mini SAS connected systems, uh, those are starting just a little bit over three thousand, so thirty to eighty eight. When we're for an eight bay sixteen terabyte. There's so many different ways that we can buy storage from standalone units directly attached to the computer to networking devices such as this. Should we make decisions solely based on price, or how do we decide what storage to get? Um, I, I'm not a big fan of basing purchases just strictly on price. Um, you know, we, we take a lot of time whenever we sell a Jupyter system to talk to the customer, get an understanding of what they're trying to do with it, what their expectations are, what they would like to see um, in the future for it, you know, what they envision is uh, uh, of what their workflow will become in the future. And we try to build a system that will let them do what they need to now, but also allow them to grow uh, easily into what they want to become. Um, so there's price is a big part of it, and we, we're very competitive. Um, you know, it's another part of our mission is to, to um, give the, the video market a little bit of TLC and, and, you know, not charge them an arm and a leg just to get the performance they need from a shared storage system. Uh, so, you know, there, there's different pieces that go into it, uh, but price is a big part. Uh, but the, the care and attention that we try to give our customers is, is I think, an even bigger part. And thank you, Chris. Chris's website is maxsales.com. He's the product developer and specialized in uh, a specialist in storage and uh, integration. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Still to come on The Buzz. The folks at Blackmagic Design keep shaking up the industry. The new DaVinci Resolve 12 could be all the video editor you need. DaVinci Resolve 12 combines professional nonlinear video editing with the world's most advanced color corrector. So now you can edit, color correct, finish, and deliver all from one system. The brand new Blackmagic Video Assist is a high resolution professional monitor and recorder that allows you to see a full pixel 1080 image large enough so you can focus a DSLR camera accurately. And the new Ursa Mini cameras provide stunning quality with a 4.6K sensor and 15 stops of dynamic range. Compact, lightweight, and built from advanced magnesium alloy. When it comes to state-of-the-art technology, look first at Blackmagic Design at blackmagicdesign.com. That's blackmagicdesign.com. Walter Biscardi is the owner of Biscardi Creative Media, an Atlanta-based post house. And for more than 20 years, Walter has produced and edited programming that airs on CNN, The Food Network, NBC, PBS, The Weather Channel, Univision, Georgia Public Television. The list is almost endless. Walter, it is always good to have you back. Welcome. Oh, thank you. The list is almost embarrassing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> After 20 years, I would be very proud of that list. That's a lot of work yeah. and a lot of effort. That's a, that's a good news read, not a bad news. Thank you. I appreciate it. I was reading on your website that your company, quote, says that we're the people who make video production easy for you. I was thinking <laughs> in this day of iPhone video and ubiquitous YouTubers, is easy still relevant? Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, there, there, there's a very much a black art mystery in how do you guys do this stuff and make it look good. I mean, just shooting a video with an iPhone or whatever, yeah, anybody can do that, and anybody can make a really fun cat video or anything like that. 
But when it comes to a client coming in the door and saying, I need a, uh, I need a video, they don't just mean I need a video. They mean I need a message. I need a marketing hook. I need a training video. I need something that is going to satisfy both what I need and what my boss is telling me that, that we need. And that's not always simple. And what I get sometimes is clients coming in saying that they've been scared off on the video production process in the past because the you know companies come in and they just start talking technical jargon and they start throwing around terms and all these camera angles, this, that, and the other, and they get scared and they don't understand it. And my whole philosophy is I just come in and talk plain English. I, you don't need to know all the technical wizardry that goes on behind the scenes. Who cares? I'm just here to... Find out what exactly is your need, what's the end game we need to get to, and we'll get you there. And we're not even going to concern you with all the technical yada, yada, yada that makes it happen. Who cares? Well, beside the fact that you and I care deeply about all the technical yada, yada, it sounds to me yes. like easy is, is another word for we take the fear away, that, that they don't have to be afraid that they don't know how all this magic works. Exactly. And, and, you know, we, we, one of the things I really enjoy is educating the clients, you know, on, on what it takes. And we got the best compliment in the world. We, we just finished recently a new uh, uh, educational program for the Gwinnett County Schools here in Georgia. They're one of the, I think, the 10 largest school districts in the United States, 175,000 kids. And the idea was to kind of sort of reboot Bill Nye Science Guy, but with very specific lessons just for the schools. And on the fifth day of shooting, after six months of prep and everything else, my client said, I had no idea how much went into just doing this. And that was like the best compliment she could have possibly given us. She was with us all five days. We shot 100, uh, 127 scenes in five days in four locations. And she was floored mm. at how seamless and everything went. And yet she knew nothing about what was going to happen when we actually showed up. She was doing script approval. She was looking at my props that I was making, this, that, and the other. But she had no idea what was going to happen when we actually showed up. And we made it fun for her. She really enjoyed the five days. And that, to me, is the epitome of video production made easy. Brought in a crew, did the script, shot three videos, 45 minutes worth of finished content. And she just said, I had no idea what went into this, but this was fun. That is fun. You know, I was thinking, mm -hmm. you are not located in L.A., I checked the map, mm -hmm. and you're not located in New York. No. Is there no. any is there any media in Atlanta anymore? Well, you mean television media? Yeah. Well, obviously, we're one of the film capitals of the United States now, thanks to the tax <laughs> credits. Um, and in fact, there was just an article recently that uh, there's not enough crew here. Uh, they're scrambling to uh, you know educate new crews so they can actually do the work. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's funny because uh, because post production is not a, not a part of that credit, so I have not been affected so much uh, in in that in in that area. But uh, you know, yeah, there's still. I mean, good gosh, you can't drive two miles without tripping over a movie set these days. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny. It's, it's really funny, and you'll see like twenty signs going down a road. Of course, they're all code names, just pointing in every which direction. You're like, seriously. Don't, don't you guys, like, run into each other out on the street somewhere? You know, I don't know. It's kind of funny. But, yeah, if, if you want to be in crew uh, on the set, I mean, i got to say, man, Atlanta and Georgia is, is hopping right now. It's, it's, it's stupid crazy right now. Do you find with your company you're doing more production or more post? We used to do all post. And uh, now that everybody and their brother can get a laptop and get, you know, Final Cut, Resolve, Premiere Pro, you know, we have definitely turned into more of a full turnkey production house. Uh, I would say when I started the company back in 2001, uh, I don't even think we did a production until like 2003, 2004. And now it's probably, you know, 75% of our business is full turnkey. So let's yeah. let's put your guru and industry wizard hat on, which you are known for. What mm. what production trends are you seeing that have caught your attention? Oh wow! Uh, well, you know, cheaper, faster, better. Obviously, um, that that is coming quickly, uh, or it has been around. I mean, we keep talking about the kids, the kids, the kids, and I, I got to say, the kids are good these days. Uh, I work with a local high school. 
And I've actually hired uh, one of the recent graduates to come in and edit a fish. She's so good at editing because she's already been doing it for five years. You know, go figure. Um, so, you know, the, the, the younger kids coming up are so much more advanced uh, at the level that they're coming out of high school and college than we ever were. I mean, you know, I, grad, you know, I graduated back in 1989-90, so, you know, it cost $2 million to get an edit suite. So if you wanted to edit, you had to work for somebody else, but now, now you actually don't. So a, a big trend I see is just a lot of people just, you know, hanging their own shingles outside their homes and saying, I'm a producer and I'm an editor. And so you're competing with a much larger pool if you want to go it alone. Um, on the production side, I mean, 4K is certainly here to stay. And it's gotten cheaper and easier to shoot, but I, I don't see a lot of people paying much attention to storage and not just the amount of storage, but having the right kind of storage to play back your media faster. And everybody's complaining that, well, my system doesn't work anymore. And yeah. it used to. I was like, well, yeah, it used to, but now you've got a lot more data and you've got to figure out how to archive and you've got to do this and the other. So, it's, 4K, um, is, 4K you know. is always about storage. It, the computer can handle mm -hmm. it, but the storage is a big yeah. issue. Before we go yeah. farther in that direction, I just realized you've got a special event coming up on Saturday, and you've stolen our producer, which I haven't yeah. forgiven you for. Tell me what's going on. <laughs> uh, we are having the Atlanta Creative Ball. It's the final event uh, of the Atlanta Cutters, uh, it's a professional user group here in Atlanta. Uh, and we always say thank you to SF Cutters for letting us borrow the name. Uh, and it, we're going to be talking content, content, content. Uh, the push to deliver as much digital content as quickly as possible across the digital universe. And so, yes, we've got Serena Catania coming in. We've got Dan Dome coming down from uh, Late Night with Seth Meyers. We've got Jonathan Tortora, who is a senior producer digital content at CNN, who just helped launch that great big story. Uh, and we've got Sean and Stephanie Mullen coming down, who uh, launched a Rampant Design Tool, and I will be uh, moderating. So we'll be talking about how everything has changed in the past couple of years, especially of what our job titles are, what kind of content we have to get out there. And then even for people like myself, uh, I'm now moving to be more of a content creator and starting up a new digital network. And, you know, the opportunity is now there for us to do anything. So it's going to be uh, two hours of fun. We've got a huge raffle. We're giving away a Blackmagic Ursa Mini. We're giving away a micro cinema camera. FSI's got some monitors in there. We've got, I don't know, I, I think 30 or 40 raffle items in there now. So, yeah, come on down. Saturday night, go to atlanticutters.com, and uh, the uh, all the information is there on how to get your ticket. And Come on down. Saturday night at uh, 7 o'clock. Is there still room for mere mortals to attend, or are you sold out? Plenty of room for mere mortals. Well, I won't say plenty of room. We've actually had a run on tickets. So, yeah, there is still room to come down. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, highly recommend it because it's our last event of the year. And if you want to network in Atlanta with other creatives, this is definitely a place to do it. In, in about a minute that we've got left, I want to come back <laughs> to one quick thing. Are you sure. finding business is still strong or are you getting eaten up by all the people that can do it in their basements? It goes back and forth. You know, there are a lot of people who will go and, you know, working in your basement isn't bad if you know what you're doing. I mean, I've done it. Um, but it goes back and forth. You know, the trend is, boy, I really, really need it cheap. And it's like, wow, that person really didn't work out. So let me try to find somebody with a little bit more experience. So a lot of people are walking the line between, I need somebody with experience, but yet I still got a budget. That per you know, that budget, that, that person might be out of my reach. Um, you know, we're building up our own camera package and things like that so we can help the clients with their budget. And so we don't have to bring in, you know, a crew and all that. Walter, thank you for joining us. I could talk with you for another half hour. It's BiscardiCreative.com. Walter Biscardi is yeah. the founder. Walter, thanks for mm -hmm. joining. I'll see you soon. Hey, have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye. Still to come on The Buzz. I've got a ton of brand new training videos showcasing all the new features in Final Cut Pro 10.2. And they're all available today. In fact, we've updated our entire Final Cut training for this release. We added more than 70 new movies covering every major and minor new feature in the software. Then I figured as long as I was recording, I added new techniques and new ways of working that I've discovered and written about in my newsletter over the years. We've updated our workflow and editing training with 31 new movies and effects with 41 new movies. 
This makes our Final Cut training the most comprehensive, most up-to-date, and most affordable way to learn everything about this amazing software. It's quick, it's easy, and it's complete. I'm proud of all of my training and especially proud of this one. Get your copy today in our store at LarryJordan.com or even better, become a member of our video training library and get access to all of our training for one low monthly price. Both are incredible values. Thanks. Welcome to Tech Talk, sponsored by Keycode Media. called the multi-band compressor. Now there's two. Ignore anything that's got legacy after it. That's for an older version. You always want to work on the new, the new version. Grab it and drag it on top of a clip. What the multi-band compressor does is this. Notice that I've selected the clip. Notice in the effect control. Click on edit and oh my goodness, just this is just out of control. What do all these controls do? And the good news is you can ignore all of them because there's a preset that we can take advantage of. And what this filter is doing is it's amplifying the softest passages of a, of a piece of voice and not amplifying the loud passages, and it's doing it, breaking it down into four frequency bands. If we look here on the left-hand side, this is frequencies below human speech, low range human speech, high end human speech, and frequencies above human speech. So really we're tweaking these two. Now remember low frequencies are your vowels. This gives your voice its richness and its warmth. High frequency sounds are your consonants. This provides a voice its diction. So what we're doing is we're amplifying the low frequency a different amount than the high frequency and the setting you want to use is broadcast. When you open this up, change to any other setting, I don't care what it is, and then go back to broadcast and it resets the filter so all the broadcast settings are set. This is a wonderful default setting for human speech. Men or women makes no difference. What it's doing is it's amplifying the softer passages more than the louder passages, and at the same time, it's setting a limit. Look down at here, see where this margin category is. If you have a voice, dialogue, a narrator, and it's the only piece of audio in your project, set this number, the margin, to negative three. If this voice is part of a mix where you've got dialogue and sound effects and music, set this number to negative 4.5. I'm going to set this to negative three because I've only got this one audio in here. What you've told the system to do is to amplify the clip, but at no time should any portion of the clip ever exceed negative three dB. Whatever the setting is in the margin, that's the loudest that part of the clip will ever be. See, what's happening is this. As the clip passes over time, through time, let's say that this instant here is negative 20 and I apply, say, 15 dB of gain to it, it goes from negative 20 to negative 5. I've taken the soft passage and made it louder. The next one is negative 18. I apply 15 dB of gain to it, it goes from negative 18 to negative 3. No problem. But the next one is negative 15. I apply 15 dB of gain, but it hits that negative 3 limit above which it can't go. The rest of that amplification gets thrown away. So the louder passages are always limited to whatever you set in the margin setting, in this case negative three, and the softer passages get full amplification. This means that the whole clip has the perception of being louder. This is the basis of both the, the multi-band compressor and the limiter filter. We'll see the limiter in a, in a little bit later. So listen to the difference. Let's just close this clip here. So let's suppress this. Let's bypass it so we don't hear what this sounds like and listen. This is microphone one. One of our key audio challenges is getting... Okay, and now let's turn it on. This is microphone one. One of our key audio challenges is getting the same talent recorded on different days using different mics to sound the same. What this does, let's just take a different clip here and let's go this one and... Um, I'm just going to drag it 
over to there. And this is a, a two-channel clip. I'm going to select both channels and apply the multi-band compressor to both. And notice that it's got it on effect track one and effect track two. I'll set this to broadcast. I got to switch off it and then switch back to get all the settings to be correct. And set the margin, that's the only one that we adjust, to negative three. And off broadcast and then back to broadcast. Set the margin to negative three because it's the only things that are going on at this time. And now play it. This is with it turned off. All right, um, we are here at the Cinedec booth, and I'm here with in awards in the industry. All right, not great. Let's just turn our compressor on. Cinedec launched at NAB of 2010 and quickly uh, garnered a couple of significant awards. Can you hear the difference? Without me having to make any other changes, just by applying the multi-band compressor, it takes the softer dialogue and makes it loud enough to be able to hear and yet guarantees that it doesn't distort. That's what that margin is doing. It's preventing any distortion by having the audio go too loud. Scott Sorensen has been the director of photography for Mythbusters ever since he graduated from college nine years ago. Before that, he says, he was a fishmonger, which is clearly training for the job. I can't think of any other show that blows through more gear than the Mythbusters. The Mythbusters. Hello, Scott. How are you? Uh, hello. Very well. How about yourself? We are doing. We we are so excited to be talking with you because Myth. Mythbusters, which I clearly can't pronounce, is one of our favorite <laughs> shows. I was just thinking, nine years ago, when you were in college, did you know that you wanted to be a director of photography? Uh, no, actually, to be honest, I, I kind of thought sound design would be my path. Uh, I've just found sound design to be really intriguing while I was in school. Uh, but when I got hired uh, on Mythbusters, uh, so I, I was I was actually first hired uh, nine years ago as the production assistant, like the only production assistant for the entire show, uh, <laughs> and kind of just fell into camera um, pretty quickly after like a couple of months. There, a high speed camera operator left uh, to go on work on to something else. And I uh, just filled in uh, his role and uh, kind of just went from there. So I have to ask, what was it like to work with that cast? Uh, it's, uh, it's a funny day for you to ask me that, because we actually just wrapped uh, Adam and Jamie yesterday. Uh, we had our, our rap party last night, and we're all feeling a little groggy today from it. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, it's it's really been phenomenal. Like it's been the uh, the way I think about it, it's been like the best like postgraduate work I could ever have hoped for. Uh, you know, I learned uh, so much about uh, cinematography and television production, uh, but then also just learning from our hosts who are very skilled people and. Uh, Super smart and creative, and you know I picked up skills just from watching them for years. Um, so it, it's been great. Well, we are all depressed that the show is stopping, is ending, because uh, I don't know what I would do with my life without being able to watch MythBusters. So let us pretend that the show hasn't wrapped for the next couple of minutes. Walk us okay. through a typical show. What would when would you know what's in the script? When would you start planning? Uh, walk us through that workflow. Uh, well, so we our usual shooting schedule is uh, 12 to 14 weeks on, and then we'll take a few weeks off. Uh, so each shooting block uh, at the start, we'll have a, a planning week where uh, the executive producers will sit down 
uh, and with the producers and camera and sound and everyone. And we'd kind of just hash out these stories that we picked for that shooting block. And, you know, from there, kind of producers start uh, researching and getting into, like, finding the crazy things that we need to, uh, you know, acquire and destroy in some fashion. Uh, so we, you know, we have that initial kind of planning week, kind of get a, a sense of what might be in the cards. And then we just kind of take it on a week by week basis and, uh, you know, just kind of roll with whatever the test results are. You know, we like to think that we kind of have an idea of what might happen, <laughs> but we're often surprised. I was just going to ask, how much of each show is planned and how much of it is roll with it on the fly on set? Well, I mean, it is, there's like, oh, there's a basic outline that we start uh, each episode with, but it's all dependent on the science. Like, if a test goes a certain way, uh, it might scrap the, the next, like, three quarters of the episode. Um, and we have, you know, just kind of roll with it and like, okay, well, this doesn't work, so uh, let's try this. And, you know, it kind of evolves as we go. It's sort of a cross between a documentary and a reality show. It is. Um, you know, the, the nice thing about Mythbusters versus uh, some reality shows I've kind of, like, day played on, though, is you don't have to shoot every single thing, like every, like every single line of dialogue, um, you know, we've gotten really good at knowing, like, okay, we're going to be building, uh, you know, this thing, and we know how much we need to film, and we know, like, you just kind of learn, like, these are the big beats. Um, you know, we're not trying to create, like, some kind of tension between housemates or something. It's uh, it's kind of more about the, the experiment than anything else. What can I mean? I was just thinking. Some of these experiments are one time only. You can only blow something up once. How many cameras are you covering, and what cameras are you using? Well, so uh, our main cameras, uh, which you know I, I do most of the filming with, is uh, the Sony XD cams, the kind of the old soldier. Um, and then uh, our second camera is kind of. The majority of our cameras, uh, we've been using the Blackmagic uh, Pocket Cam uh, for the last two years. Um, we've got about 10 of them now um, that we'll use. Uh, you know, we won't use 10 for every single thing, but uh, we'll set them up, um, uh, you know, just a variety of different shots, kind of trying to think of every possible, uh, you know, case what might happen. Uh, because ultimately we're we're there to document the experiment, and if our coverage doesn't show what happens, like if you know you miss this part of this this test, then you kind of lost some of the result. Um, so we've got the ten Black Magics, two FS seven hundreds, uh, a Phantom V twelve point one, uh, a NAC K four, uh, an older high speed camera. Uh, I think, uh, honestly, well, we've, we've had a, a number of GoPros in the past. I think at the, our peak, we maybe had like 15 GoPros. Um, as of today, I think we're down to maybe six and a half. <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, we actually almost killed six cameras in one shot uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, but, uh, to their credit, they're, they're not quite dead. Um, but then, other than that, let's see, uh, we've got a, uh, a thermal camera that we will use on certain experiments. Uh, we recently... Wait, wait, wait. Take uh, a breath. Take a breath. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I've already lost count. We're up to about 7,500 cameras at the moment. <laughs> you, you're yeah, shooting... I, I, I was just going to say, you know, we're not shooting on every single camera every single day. Uh, you know, we don't break out the, the Phantom for everything. Uh, we we don't have ten cameras rolling on everything. It's we try to be sensible so that we don't uh, kill the edit assistant who has to go through all the footage. Sensible is not a word I would ever use to describe MythBusters. <laughs> 
but aside from that, you're shooting about six different codecs. Which codec do you edit, and how are you delivering dailies to editorial? Well, so uh, all our post-production uh, is done in Australia, um, just outside of Sydney. Uh, the production company that makes Mythbusters is Australian. And uh, so every Friday we send a box with uh, a couple of hard drives and maybe like a dozen or so XD cam discs, uh, FedEx every Friday to Sydney, and they, they cut it all there. Um, but in, ter- in terms of codecs, we're shooting uh, the pockets. We're shooting in um, ProRes 422 uh, and the, the XDs, just the highest, uh, the highest bit rate we can get out of them. And just the FS is pretty much the same same story. ABC HD, uh, GoPros or MPEG. Um, yeah, the, the post production they deal with a lot. They've, they've we kind of hit them from all angles with <laughs> every single different kind of footage. And to their credit, they can kind of stitch it all together and make it not jarring that you know we're, we're shooting on all these different kinds of cameras. Uh, we have a live chat going at the same time as, as the show, and Don on our live chat's asking, with all the craziness going on, does anybody get injured in production? Uh, the worst injuries uh, that have ever occurred on a Mythbuster set, and I, ha- I haven't been there for most of them, but uh, I think they've all involved safety equipment. Um, Mostly the the blast shields, the uh, bulletproof shields that uh, you often see us kind of crouch behind during an explosion or a, a firearms test. Uh, those suckers weigh like maybe 200, 250 pounds, and you know shifting them around can be hazardous. I think we had a broken thumb, um, maybe a couple of broken digits, but that's pretty much the worst we've had. Well, that's a tribute to you for paying attention to safety, so congratulations. Thank you. What uh, what size crew are you working with on a typical shoot? And I know typical is a, a weasel word. Uh, well, so the core crew is uh, myself and my two operators, uh, Will Nail and Duncan Clark, uh, as well as our uh, sound recordist, Matt Jepson. Um, and we'll shoot the bulk of the show um, with, uh, you know, Adam and Jamie, and we've got our director, Steve Christensen, and uh, Declan Marker. Um, they kind of split duties with uh, direction. Uh, and then we'll actually, kind of the nice thing about the show being such a small crew uh, is we'll Pull PAs onto camera duty. Um, have them operate the Phantom, and uh, we had a kind of an all hands on deck situation two weeks ago where we kind of laid waste to uh, the Alameda runway over about 3,000 feet of uh, kind of a path of destruction. And so it was kind of yeah. I had every I think I had every PA we had on that shoot was had a camera on in their hands. Of, as you look back on it, what's been the most bizarrely memorable episode that you've shot? <clears throat> bizarrely memorable. Um, huh. hmm. uh, I would have to say the most bizarre, <laughs> the most bizarre thing I've ever shot was uh, the president of the United States. Uh, we we went to the White House uh, to start an episode. Uh, where um, President Obama made a request for uh, the Mythbusters to retest a, an old myth. And it was kind of surreal uh, being in the White House, uh, you know, filming the president. I, I was filming the president single. And uh, it, was, it was strange. It was like you would you'd look into the viewfinder, it's like, okay. You know, it's kind of like watching television, but then you'd open your other eye and be like, ooh, okay. <laughs> oh, he's really there. That's, that's crazy. Um, but, yeah, that, that was probably the strangest um, for me personally. What are you going to miss now that the show is wrapped? Uh, 
I mean, I'm going to miss working with the crew on, on like, a daily basis. I know, I know that we're all going to stay in touch. Um, you know, I think we'll all kind of gravitate uh, to each other here in San Francisco. Um, but, it, you know, it won't be five days a week, you know, uh, nine to five. Like it's, it'll, be, it'll be different circumstances. Well, I can imagine what it's like to uh, to rap after you've been on a show for for as long as you have. What are you going to be working on next? Uh, next up, I don't know. I you know I've been uh, trying to think of that for a little while now, but it's kind of been like the last few weeks have been appropriately huge um, in terms of what we have coming up to end the show. And I really haven't had a, a moment to, to kind of focus on the next thing. It's just like, okay, I've, I've got today, maybe tomorrow in mind. But uh, beyond that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Uh, it's, hopefully, it's... you know, more explosions are cool. I'd be into that, you know. It's, uh, it's scary to go back and shoot something that doesn't blow up on you all the time. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, after a while, you get so used to things blowing up. It's like, you know, okay, it's not as it's not as startling. Uh, um, maybe not for you, but it's still fascinating television. If you haven't had a chance to watch the MythBusters, go to discovery dot com slash tv shows slash MythBusters. Every episode is incredible. And Scott, thanks for joining us. It's a show I've loved for years, and I very much appreciate your work. Oh, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Scott Sorensen is the director of photography for Mythbusters, which wrapped yesterday. It's time for a Buzz flashback, five years ago today. I'm the typical entrepreneur. One of my clients leaned over and said, you're really good. You should open your own place. And I said, would you be my first client? They said, absolutely. They never showed up, but <laughs> I took uh, my bar mitzvah money and some money I got from a car accident that I was in, and I built a studio. My original goal was to make musical signatures for a product. This was a Buzz flashback. I was reflecting on Walter Biscardi's comments on the business in Atlanta. It's easy for us to lose sight of the fact that production is much more than the people in front of the camera or the producers and directors, but crew is critical, as we heard with Scott Sorensen and the work that he was doing with the Mythbusters, that uh, there's plenty of opportunities in Atlanta, and it's good to know that, that the media world is hopping down there. I want to thank our guests for today, starting with Chris Hafner. He's a storage specialist at OWC, talking about the new Jupiter storage products. Then Walter Biscardi, the owner of Biscardi Creative Media in Atlanta, and Scott Sorensen, the director of photography for Mythbusters. There's a lot of history in our industry, and it's all posted to our website at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Here you can find thousands of interviews all online and all available to you today. And please sign up for our free weekly show newsletter. It comes out every Friday. Talk with us on Twitter at DPBuzz and Facebook at digitalproductionbuzz.com. Our theme music is composed by Nathan Doogie Turner with additional music provided by smartsound.com. Text transcripts are provided by Take One Transcription. Visit takeone.tv to learn how they can help you with your transcripts. Our producer is Serena Catania, who's currently heading to Atlanta. Our engineering team, led by Megan Paulos, includes Ed Golia, Keegan Guy, Hannah Dean, and James Miller. On behalf of Mike Horton, my name is Larry Jordan, and thanks for joining us for the Digital Production Buzz. The Digital Production Buzz was brought to you by Otherworld Computing, providing quality hardware solutions and extensive technical support to the worldwide computer industry since 1988. And by Blackmagic Design,
creating revolutionary solutions for film, post-production, and television.